Welcome to our guide to prenatal care for low-risk pregnancies. My name is Dr. Zolis. I'm a general OBGYN working in Toronto. So we're going to talk about your office visits and what to expect. You'll notice that your OB care provider will probably be suggesting some phone visits as well as some in-person visits. So here's an example of a timeline that your OB provider may recommend. So at 36 weeks, um, you will need a GBS swab and a physical exam. This will be described in a later slide. You'll start thinking about preparing your bag for delivery. Um, you'll have some more frequent in-person visits where your OB provider may offer you a stretch and sweep. We'll also go through this. Um, at 39 weeks, your OB care provider may want to see you in the office or may feel comfortable doing an, uh, a telephone visit, depending on the type of pregnancy you're having. And then if you hit your due date or pass your due date, your OB care provider will see you in the office most likely. So let's talk about a GBS swab. GBS stands for Group B Streptococcus. It's a type of that bacteria that live on 30% of women in their genital tracts. It is not an infection, it is a colonizing bacteria, which means it normally lives on 30% of women. Why do we test for it in pregnancy? Well, we test for it in pregnancy because if you do carry GBS, there is a chance that in labor, as the baby passes through the vaginal canal, the baby could get infected with group B streptococcus. If the baby gets infected with group B streptococcus, the baby could get sick with infections in the brain or the lungs or the blood. We test you um, with a vaginal and rectal swab. Your OB care provider will explain this to you um, at around 35 to 37 weeks. Please let your OB care provider know if you have a penicillin allergy. If you are GBS positive, we treat you with IV penicillin while you're in labor every four hours. So the risk to the baby is very small. Um, even if we do nothing, the risk is very small. But if we treat you with IV penicillin in labor, your risk becomes even smaller of passing the bacteria to your baby. Membrane sweeping. So this is something your OB care provider may offer you. Um, this entails a vaginal exam. So we insert our fingers into your vagina and feel your cervix. The membranes is another term for water bag. So when we insert our fingers into the vagina, we can feel the water bag and sweep the water bag away from the cervix. In this area, there are a lot of your own hormones, prostaglandins. So it essentially increases your own natural hormonal production. So this is something that we can do to help decrease your risk of needing an induction if you pass your due date. There's no harm in doing this. There's no harm to your baby or to you. It's quite uncomfortable sometimes, um, but so is being 39 weeks pregnant. So um, most women opt to have this done, but it is optional. So next we're gonna talk about uh, things to start thinking about. So one thing you should think about is making sure you have a baby doctor organized. So that would either be your family doctor or a pediatrician. You don't have to have an appointment organized because you don't have a baby yet, but once the baby comes, um, you will be reminded in the hospital to call your baby care provider. So you should know who that person will be. Um, another follow-up you'll have after you go home from the hospital is with your OB care provider. So we will remind you that after the baby is born to follow up with your midwife, your family doctor, or your obstetrician. Best practice medication history. Your OB care provider will likely give you um, an information sheet to fill out where you're supposed to fill out your um, most up-to-date medications, including prescription and non-prescription medications. And this will be sent to the hospital and uh, input in your chart. So this is a slide just outlining some helpful free applications um, to help monitor your pregnancy and your labor. There's also a video here explaining contractions. So if you want to pause, you can pause um, and take your time to watch this video. So getting ready for the hospital. This is always an exciting part. Um, you know, some women come into the hospital with suitcases and suitcases of things. You don't need that. Um, I usually tell my patients, pack as if you're going away for one or two nights. You want to pack your toiletries, like your hairbrush, your toothbrush, your face wash. Um, you want to pack some comfy clothes. So slippers are important, some sort of flip-flops or slippers. So you don't have to bend down to put on and off your shoes. 
um, some loose pajamas, uh, several pairs of underwear are usually needed and loose underwear if you have them. Um, you know, you can read this slide and look at some of the other things we suggest. The baby actually doesn't need a lot of things. Um, usually the hospital supply baby diapers that you can bring your own baby diapers um, and obviously a car seat. So every baby leaving the hospital needs a car seat. So definitely don't forget this. You don't need to bring it in, um, in labor, but you leave it in the car. So when you're ready to be discharged from the hospital, um, you'll have it available to you. And then one thing you want to know is where do you go? So when contractions start or your water breaks, where do you go? So every hospital runs a little bit differently. Um, make sure you speak to your OB care provider so you know exactly where to go. So when do you go to the hospital? This is something I counsel my patients about in their, their late third trimester. So a good way to remember is A, B, C, D. So A, anytime you feel your baby is moving less than normal. This is actually really important. So if you don't feel your baby moving at all, obviously you should come in. If you feel your baby moving less than normal, then you can do something called kick counts. I think this has been described already in a previous video, but essentially you wanna feel six movements in two hours. You don't do this all day, every day. You just check if you're worried the baby's not moving, you can do a kick count and check to see if the baby's moving six times in two hours. Bleeding, um, another reason to come to the hospital, a little bit of blood is not a concern, but anything that's flowing or anything that resembles a period, you need to come and get the baby checked. So contractions, um, there's a, a, a rule called the 511 rule or the 411 rule, where you come to the hospital if you are having regular painful contractions. So a contraction is uh, a pain in your abdomen that's very strong, it takes your breath away. If you have that contraction every, we usually say three to five minutes. So let's say every four minutes to cut it in half. So if you have a contraction every four minutes lasting for one minute and that pattern lasts for one hour, you can come to the hospital if it's your first baby. If it's your second baby, you can come a little bit sooner. Even if they're coming every five or six or seven minutes and they're regular, you can come. I think the bottom line for this is you don't have to rush to the hospital with your first contraction. There is good evidence that it's safe to um, labor at home uh, for the early parts of labor. So once you hit the, the 411 rule, you should proceed to the hospital. And then your water breaking. Um, you know, sometimes you have the big gush like you see in the movies and, and your pants are soaking wet and then that's pretty obvious. You should come to the hospital. Um, but for other, for other women, it's a little bit more subtle. So when your water breaks, you either have a big gush or you have persistent trickling of clear fluid from the vagina. So if you have persistent trickling of clear fluid from the vagina, you should come in and get assessed to see if your water has broken. So now we're gonna talk about COVID-19 changes in your labor and delivery experience. So I'm gonna preface this slide by saying it changes all the time. Um, but as for now, um, one thing that probably won't change is your healthcare providers will be wearing PPE. That is one big change on labor and delivery uh, pretty much all the time. So you expect your healthcare provider to be in a mask and often also a face shield. So this is now the new normal. The second uh, major change is our visitor policy. Most labor and delivery floors in Ontario are allowing one partner to be with you during labor and delivery. And this partner will be asked to leave two hours postpartum. And then postpartum changes. Um, really, while you're in hospital now, you'll be with the nursing team and you won't have a partner with you. So the nursing team will play a more active role in helping take care of you and your baby. Please also remember that these COVID-19 changes are rapidly changing. So the best thing is to stay in touch with your OB care provider and ask questions about what the COVID-19 changes are at your hospital. So one question I often get is I'm feeling incredibly anxious about giving birth. What should I do to cope? So I hear this quite a bit from my patients. I find my first time mommies are nervous because they don't know what to expect and my second time mommies are nervous because they know what to expect. So I think there's a lot of anxiety that surrounds the late stages of pregnancy. I respond to this by telling my patients that they can control what they can control and some things they can't control. 
So to control what you can control is trying to keep your body and your mind healthy and fit. So being active as much as you can. So that means stretching, doing yoga, going for walks, trying to keep your body fit and active is important. And trying to keep your mind fit and active is also very important. So whether that means doing meditation, spending time with your loved ones, taking time to relax, I think is really important. And there are some things that you can't control and you have to have faith that your body knows what to do and that your healthcare providers know what to do. So when you come into the hospital, we will walk you through things, explain things to you and try to keep you as educated and as calm as possible. Another question I frequently get is what do I do if I don't feel contractions and my water doesn't break? Well, for the answer to this question, you should watch our next video, which includes information about what happens when you pass your due dates. So that concludes this video. Please consider filling out the anonymous post-survey questionnaire. Congratulations okay. for making it this far. Don't forget to download the handouts by clicking the description link below. Please consider watching the seventh and final video in our series, Why is the Baby Not Here Yet? This will discuss what happens after you pass your due date.